Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Cedar Home. Why don't you go ahead and stand, and we will get started with worship. Praises rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna.
Okay, if you could go ahead and have a seat. It's good to hear people fellowshipping and together. Uh, I was with the youth at the hockey game last night, and you guys aren't as loud as that, but it was pretty good, pretty close. Um, we had a great time with the youth group. Thanks, Eric, for putting that together um, and bringing that together. Uh, a few announcements for this morning, but I'm going to start off first, and I'm going to read Zechariah 9.9. And thinking back to what we're celebrating this coming week of Easter and Christ's death and resurrection, um, but 450 to 500 years prior to Jesus riding in uh, to town, uh, it was prophesied. Uh, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I can't even project what's going to happen for me tomorrow, but this was projected 450 to 500 years before that. Pretty amazing, right, Uh, that we have an awesome God that we serve. And if you're in relationship with him, we can celebrate that. Uh, So that's terribly exciting. So um, next week, next Sunday is Easter, and so um, Good Friday service on next Friday, this coming Friday, and next uh, Sunday is Easter. Make sure you pick up one of these cards and give them to someone who maybe doesn't attend church, maybe doesn't know Jesus or have a personal relationship with him. Uh, Let's try to get these out. Let's pack this place. And in regards to that, If you have kids and you register kids out at the kiosk, let me make sure I say it correctly, Uh, check your kids in early if you can, uh, because if we have visitors, they're going to take a little bit more time at the kiosk to check their kids in. So if you can remember that, that would be great. Uh, That comes straight from Amanda, a request from Amanda and Annie to do that. connection card. If you're new with us, we are thankful that you're here, and we want to get to know you. Um, We would love to have you fill out a connection card. If you don't have one of these, uh, you can get them at either of the entrances. Um, Some of the ushers can give you this connection card. On the back, uh, there are prayer requests and praises. We would love to hear your praises as well as your prayer requests. So if God has done something in your life recently or is continuing to do things, please uh, fill this out and so the leadership can be praying for you. Um, Next Sunday, men's study uh, that usually meets on Sunday morning will not be meeting because it's Easter, okay? So if you know somebody who is in that uh, study, please let them know about that. Um, Make sure I get everything here. And we're going to do something special today. Uh, We're going to bring some folks up to the front and people who are going to Panama and Guatemala. And so if those people in the leadership will come up now, that would be great. It is a great opportunity we have because we are commissioning members from Cedar Home who are going on two different uh, mission trips. And Sam, come on over here. <laughs> Sam is uh, going where? Guatemala. And how many are going? We are going about 12. 12 people. He's uh, part of a team from uh, Savannah, right? Yes, yeah, Savannah Peace Lutheran. And what will you be doing in Guatemala? We will be um, installing a cook stove um, and eventually some water tanks. Okay. So let's be praying for Sam and the team, and uh, he'll be well taken care of. His, his aunt Mary is leading the team, right? Yes, yes, yes. And your cousin's going with? Mm-hmm. So take care of them. <laughs> okay, uh, so, so Sam, uh, his, the, the funds for the stoves have been collected. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but you're still raising money for the water tanks. Yes, yes, we are. Okay. 
at each door, exit door, there would be a box like this that says Guatemala Mission Supply. So if you want to participate in buying water tanks and uh, so forth there, there is, uh, Scripture talks about as we, where your treasure is, there your heart is. So if you give some, you're probably more likely to pray and be interested in what the team does. <laughs> so, and, and also, thank you, Elif. And uh, <laughs> uh, Sam's expenses for this trip is uh, $2,300, mm -hmm. which uh, all but 1000 has been raised. This is for the travel down and the expenses, food, and so forth. So if you want Sam to come back, uh, <laughs> and if you want him to eat while he's there. I don't mind if you don't. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's up to you, obviously, for both. <laughs> Aleph, okay. Aleph is going on his annual trip to Panama. And uh, tell us what you're going to be doing there and how many are going. All right. Uh, we're taking people from actually all over. Um, got people come from Ecuador, from uh, the Midwest, um, from here in Stanwood. Uh, we probably have a total of, I think, about 22 right now that are coming from different places. So, um, And we'll be doing well drilling and doing some medical and dental and VBS and just a little bit of everything. So, yeah. Okay. Now, Aleph has uh, purchased and... Uh, medical supplies, $1,000 worth of medical supplies, and $400 worth of audio Bibles that you're taking down there to give. So there again, an opportunity to share in that ministry, to help people through the medical supplies, to give out audio Bibles. So I encourage you to participate, one or both or all, whatever you like. So just want to make that opportunity. There's no obligation, of course. So we're going to pray for these. Now Rob is going and others with you. So we're going to have Rob go down about halfway down, Aleph about half, and Sam. And the leadership's going to gather around and give you the opportunity to gather around, lay hands on them. And I'll be praying. And uh, Ben, you'll be praying yeah. as well. OK, let's go. So feel free to stand up and gather around, lay hands on them or towards them. <laughs> okay, let's, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to participate in these mission trips because we know that doing work for you to serve fellow believers in other countries to, to make the gospel present to others who don't know you yet as they see good works done by followers of Jesus, that, uh, Lord, you are advancing the kingdom through your servants. So, Lord, we pray for Sam and the team that's going to Guatemala. We pray for safety in their travels. May everything function well on the plains and on land. Give them safety, protect them, give them opportunities to present your word, may your, your light shine through them, and people be seeing the, the light of Jesus through each one. But may the work that they're doing of installing the stoves and the water tanks just be a blessing and a help for their health and well-being. Lord, we thank you for this. May you just go with them, before them, and follow them as well. And Lord, we, we lift up the team that's heading to Panama, Lord. Uh, I pray for Aleph specifically and his leadership, God. I pray that uh, you would anoint him uh, with just the both the means and the skill and the opportunity, all the ways in which you have gifted him, Lord, to lead and to, to lead well, God, to represent you uh, before the nations. And God, we, we lift up the entire team. Uh, in the same way, would you give them travel mercies? Would you be a part of that journey, uh, both in uh, heading down to Panama and coming back? And would you be a part of the entire team, Lord, uh, from, from all nations coming together to proclaim 
proclaim the, the gospel, Lord, to address needs specifically, to, to be able to provide VBS and to provide medical care. God, would you be in the midst of that? Uh, provide words um, of, of power in your gospel to be able to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ to those who have not heard it before. And we pray that uh, hearts would respond, that you would call people out of their sin, and that you would be glorified and honored in the great work uh, that you're calling this team to do. Lord, would you preserve them uh, amongst each other, uh, help them to encourage one another and to um, help each other as their bodies are weary, Lord, as their, their hearts might be weary. Uh, would you uplift them and fill them with your spirit that they would be about the work, that they would be maturing in you and that your love would be manifest in this great work that you're going to do in Panama. Lord Jesus, thank you for this church. Thank you for our opportunity to send our brothers and sisters in Christ. Would you fill our hearts with the need to, uh, to not just go, but to support those that go, that this work that you have commanded us to do to make disciples would be multiplied amongst the nations. And Lord Jesus, that you would be glorified and honored in that work. We love you, Lord. And we thank you for this day and for this time that we have to celebrate the work that you're going to do. We anticipate it greatly, Jesus, and we lift all of these things up in your name. Amen. 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 And at this time, I'm going to call the ushers up for offering. Um, but... It's exciting uh, what this church is doing around the world and how we can do here in Stanwood also. And so I always like to say that let's be a cheerful giver to what God's doing. And as we give our tithes and offerings that we would be cheerful givers to him. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. God, thank you that uh, you have given us resources and that we can give those back to you. God, I pray that uh, those resources that we give will, will work to further your kingdom, to spread your gospel here in Stanwood and throughout uh, the area and, God, throughout the world. And so, Lord, uh, we give back to you what you have given to us, and we thank you uh, for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. stand with us. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never. Oh, 
are welcome to take their children over to junior church.
Father, thank you for, thanks for bringing us here, God, and, and uh, thanks for this message that you're going to um, give us through Ben, that you've prepared, and that he's going to give us, and uh, I just pray for open minds and hearts uh, to hear your word, and uh, we love you, we thank you, in your name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, worship team. Morning, Cedar Home. How y'all doing? It's a good day, right? Yeah, it's a good day. We're going to be in Philemon today. Uh, if you want to figure out where that is, it's right after Titus. If you go to Hebrews, you've gone too far. So Philemon, we're going to be in the whole letter of Philemon, but don't worry, it's just one chapter. If this is your first time joining us. We are really glad that you are here. We are in the last week of this sermon series that we've been going through entitled Little Church, Big Christ. We've been looking at the book of Colossians. We have been exploring Christian maturity that conducts the work of the ministry in the shadow of a very big Christ. And so a lot of wonderful images, a lot of uh, time that we've spent in this book, but it's, it's, it's almost time for us to move on. So I, I just want to let you know, over the next five weeks, we're going to be transitioning into a new series entitled Triumphant God. We are going to be working our way through the Easter season all the way from the cross to Pentecost. It's going to be a lot of fun. And so I just want to reiterate to you something that Shay had already articulated beautifully, is that if you have not already, you should take advantage of the fact that you got a little card and a wonderful outlet to tell people about a service that they can come to in order to explicitly hear the gospel. We talked about that last week, is that card can represent life for someone, right? The first time that they hear the gospel, or maybe the hundredth time that they've heard the gospel, but the first time in which God works in their hearts and allows them to receive it. So please take advantage of that. Okay. Like I said, we're going we're to work through Philemon. I'm going to give you some reasons for why we are working through that letter today. But first, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for this time that we have had to worship you through song, through the, the celebration of the work that is happening, not just here in Stanwood, Lord, but all around the world. Would you bless this time that we have now as we get into your word? Lord, would it be edifying to you as your people open up this letter and, and seek to understand the ways in which a letter from Paul to a man named Philemon can still apply to us today. Lord Jesus, be glorified and honored in the things that are said and the meditations of our hearts. And Lord, we lift these things up to you in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. So just in terms of opening, let me, let me spell out why we're looking at the letter of Philemon. Because some of you are like, well, I thought we were in Colossians. I thought that was over. I thought we were moving on. Well, Philemon is actually kind of like an appendix to, or appendices. Appendices? Appendices? Come on, I'm looking for the vocab folk in here who know what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, anyhow, it's a connection to the letter of Colossians, right? There are strong indications within the letter of Colossians that these two letters were carried together, right? We had learned last week that Tychicus and Onesimus were two of the gentlemen that were carrying the letter to the Colossians. And yet in that, what we have is an insinuation that this letter also included a, an additional message to this man named Philemon that was going to carry out some instructions that Paul had for him very specifically. In fact, we are going to figure out why it says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 9, that Onesimus is one of the Colossians' faithful and beloved brothers. He is one of them. So let's go ahead and let's read through this entire letter together, okay? And then when we are doing that, we're going to break this into three parts. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all of the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, 
because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you. I'm sending my very heart. I would have been very glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bond servant, as a slave, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in flesh and in the Lord. And so if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so does Mark and Arch- Ar- 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 Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. All right. Who in here, that was the first time in your life that you read through a whole book of the Bible in one sitting? Oh, wow, you, you bunch of holy people. No one, no one raised their hand, or you were too embarrassed. That's really cool. We just read through a whole book of the Bible, okay? And hopefully in the course of that reading, you got a feel for the characters of this letter and the conflict that is going on, okay? The the letter to Philemon is this invitation by the Apostle Paul to a Christian man of good reputation, and his name is Philemon. And he's encouraging him to reconcile to another brother whose name is Onesimus. And notice also that this appeal is not going to a stranger, right? Paul might have written this letter to the Colossians, not knowing many of them, but he knew Philemon. In fact, based on verse 19, we can deduce that Paul was likely the one that presented the gospel to Philemon at some point in the past, off script when we didn't see it. Also, we can also see why Paul called Onesimus one of the Colossians, because now we know that he was from Colossae. In fact, he was a slave who belonged to Philemon. We can be confident that Onesimus had previously run away from Philemon. He had fled to Rome where Paul is. He had become a believer under Paul's teaching, and now he had become useful to Paul in the ministry that was happening within those prison walls. However, Paul says that will not do. For there is a relationship between Philemon and Onesimus that needs to be reconciled. And so he chose, in addition to the letter to Colossians, to send this letter to Philemon. And we can see in Paul's logic and his intent that he desires that two men, once divided by their culture and their economic status, would be forever united in Christ. And so today we're going to take a look at this letter through the lens of the change that happens in a person's life when the gospel truly takes root. There are some themes in the letter as you're reading through. Forgiveness saturates the entire thing. Friends, that's not what we're going to look at specifically today. Today we want to see a case study of what happens when the gospel gets a hold of two men's hearts, three men's hearts, and how that's spelled out all over the pages here. We're going to do it through three observations, and this is the very first one. The rooted gospel results in change, even if that change is subtle. Okay? The rooted gospel results in change, even if that change is subtle. Okay, let me define the word subtle for you, because maybe that didn't really make sense. Subtle is a term that means uh, something is delicately con 
complex and understated, so delicate or so precise as to be difficult to analyze or describe at times. And so it's something that might go unnoticed, right? But that does not make it less important. So the first thing we might notice as we're taking a look at the opening of this letter is that Paul introduces himself in a unique unique way, doesn't he? He says often in his letters that he has apostolic authority. We could look at Colossians, for example, and, and we would read that Paul says he's an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Or sometimes Paul likes to remind us of what his relationship to Christ is. In Romans, he calls himself a slave of Christ. But see, Philemon is different. In this relational dynamic, he wants to express something very specific to Philemon. And so he says, I am Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. It's not a fancy title. It's not a theological link to anything deeper. No, in this personal letter, he's going to ask Philemon uh, where he's going to ask Philemon to respond to the commands of the gospel. He's going to express first that the gospel has cost him everything that he is writing this very letter from a prison cell. But the really interesting thing about this choice is that what it does is it subtly communicates to us today something that we might miss if we aren't looking for it. See, the letter to Philemon begins with the truth that despite Paul's incarceration, despite the likely suffering that he was experiencing, even as Philemon was reading this letter, still, Paul considered the relationship between these two men that he loved so important that he wrote this letter from prison to see that relationship restored. The gospel had had even a subtle change on Paul's decision-making process. But see, that's not all. We get some fun facts in verse 2. We could read in verse 2, it says, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker. But then what does it say? It says, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in his house. Now, friends, the whole rest of the letter, we can tell even in the language, is directed specifically towards Philemon. And so what's he doing here? Why does he include all of these other names? Talk about a subtle change. Look, church, the letter might bear the name of Philemon, but what Paul wants us to know is that he is communicating an address to more than just one man. See, first he includes Aphia. Not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture, but based on the context, a lot of people like to say that, he, uh, that she is Philemon's wife. And here's the thing. As Philemon's wife, Aphia would have been as much a party to the decision on Onesimus' life as a slave because according to the custom of the time, she as his wife had day-to-day responsibility for the slaves. And so in singling her out as sister in Christ, Paul is appealing to her to be a part of a very hard decision that he is very shortly going to be addressing directly to Philemon. Then we have Archippus. He's mentioned, you might remember him from last week, right? We talked about how he received a message from Paul to see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. That verse, along with the mention here, has led a lot of people to theorize that Archivist must be the pastor in Colossae. He took over for Epaphras. So now he's leading the church, and in that responsibility, he is given the opportunity to have accountability for Philemon, to encourage him to respond to the message that Paul was about to give him. And finally, church, what we see is that Paul addresses his message to the church as a whole the church in Philemon's home. And so in a letter where Paul's going to be calling Philemon to act out this profession of faith, Paul is simultaneously including a really subtle indication of how life has changed when the gospel takes root in every Christian's life. Listen to this. In Christ, we take responsibility for the Christian maturity of others. Even when it's awkward, even when it's hard, even when it means that we have to hold each other accountable to really hard truths. And church, if you blink, you might miss it. But Paul's telling the church that now was the chance to prove that they believe that that's true. The gospel produces subtle changes in Paul's behavior. It produces subtle changes even in the life of the church. And then Paul shows us that it has produced already subtle changes in the life of Philemon. 
It says in verse 4 through 7, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I, I have heard all the way from Rome of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, it is manifest in the love that you have for all of the saints. And so I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and much comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you. Now, as we're taking a look at that, there's something really important we ought to take a look at. It says in verse 6, Paul's laying the groundwork for the appeal that he's going to make to Philemon, right? He, he says that in sharing Philemon's faith, in the activity of his faith, in, in sharing out this relational fellowship of faith, the things that he does as a Christian, the result will be his own deeper and growing knowledge of every good thing in Christ, a deeper awareness and experience of the blessings that are in Christ. And so before Paul commands Philemon to act out his faith, he reminds Philemon that if he chooses to act out his faith, it will only grow his knowledge and experience in the Lord and the blessings of obedience. It's going to cause maturity, Paul reminds him. But see, to drive that point home, what Paul does is he sandwiches, verse 6, between evidence of how that change has already happened in his life. Letting Philemon see the, the way that the gospel has already taken root in his heart. Paul says, I thank God for you, Philemon. Your love and your faith towards Christ is being poured out to the rest of the church. You're responding to Christ's commands in the, the love that you already are showing to the brothers. And listen, all the way in Rome, my brother, all the way in Rome, you are comforting me and you are bringing joy to my heart because you are a comfort and a joy to the entire church. You're refreshing them. That word means you are bringing life to the church. Friends, the gospel causes us to care about the needs of others over time, even in the midst of suffering. The gospel causes us to take responsibility of the maturity of other Christians. The, the gospel causes us to live in a way in which the love of Christ radiates from us into the whole church. And the result of that radiation is life. These are subtle changes that Paul points out. They're sort of things that we'll just read right over if we're not looking for them. And so I want to ask you, as you hear those examples of how it was being lived out back then, do we see our lives showing the example of this effect? Has the gospel had such an effect on you that you are participating in the life of your family and in the life of this church in this way? Listen, listen, would Christians around you today have confidence that they could speak truth into your life because they see the fruit of the gospel in your life and they know that you're going to receive the accountability that the Lord calls them to express to you specifically? A rooted gospel will result in subtle change. Our next point is this. The, the gospel requires... Radical commitment. The gospel insists on radical change. The gospel requires radical commitment. The gospel insists on radical change. Let's take a look starting in verse 8. Paul says, accordingly, though I am bold enough. It's an interesting word. He, uh, John uses the same word in 1 John chapter 2, verse 21. It's translated confident. There. The, the type of confidence that allows us to go before the throne of God with assurance that he hears our prayers. Man, Paul has that kind of confidence in his life in Christ to command Philemon to do what is required. Yet for love's sake, he says, I prefer to appeal to you, to call to you. I, Paul, I'm an old man. And now I'm a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. So I'm, I'm appealing to you, brother, for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you. Now he is indeed useful to you and to me. And I am sending you, or him back to you. I am sending my very heart. 
Okay. Now, I hope that you see that Paul is being very careful in his words as he's heading towards this command that he's going to give Philemon. See, first, he establishes his right to speak into Philemon's life, right? I'm an apostle. I can do this. I have the authority. However, Paul still chooses to give Philemon the opportunity to participate, right? He says, I appeal. It means I call on you to do this thing. Then Paul starts uh, talking up Onesimus, right? He wants to make sure that Philemon understands Onesimus' value. He explains that Onesimus has become useful to Paul in ministry. This is not going to be funny, but it is a joke. In verse 11, Onesimus, uh, the, the name is translated as useful. That's what his name means. It's not a great name. His name means useful. And so what Paul is doing here is he's doing a little play on words. He says, formerly he was useless to you. Now he is very useful to you. He's living up to his name. But on it, it stops being funny when you explain the joke, but it's, um, it's really, really obvious that Paul is trying to lighten the mood here. And that's actually really amusing as you're reading through a letter. He's lightening the mood because he is being delicate and he's being gentle like a leader ought to be with the people of God. And he's calling Onesimus his heart. He says, splachna. That's what the word is for heart. That's not the normal word for heart. It's just a really fun word. It almost sounds like Klingon. It means guts, right? It, it means guts. Uh, and so he's saying like, Ugh, I'm giving you my guts. I need those, but I'm giving it to you. And then Paul calls him his adopted son in the faith, and that is not a title that he takes very lightly. And so what we have here is a really obvious attempt by Paul to make sure that Philemon has every reason to understand Onesimus' value now in Christ. And then he drops the bombshell. It says in verse 12, I'm sending him back to you. I'm sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment in the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but by your own accord. For perhaps this is why he was parted with you from, from you for a while, that, that you might have him back now forever, not as a slave, but as more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, Philemon? both in the flesh and in the Lord. Now, friends, there's a lot of ink that's been spilt on this specific passage. People want to understand this passage through the lens of trying to figure out what the Bible has to say about slavery. We're not going to talk about that much here today. What we're going to try and acknowledge here is two simple, unavoidable facts that Paul lays out for Philemon. Two perspectives that we can see from the outside looking in. Let's start in verse 12, when Paul brings clarity to the awkward fact that Onesimus, his slave, is now standing before him again, delivering a message to his former master. In verse 12, Paul says, Paul sent him back. I am sending him back to you. Now, church, understand this. Onesimus' status was the lowest that one could reach in the ancient world. He was a runaway slave, okay? He had no protection of law. He was subject to all manner of abuse. Fugitive slaves usually went to large cities like Rome. They'd go to remote parts of the Roman Empire, or they would settle in unsettled areas in order to avoid detection. However, if they were caught... They could expect to be beaten unmercifully or put to tasks in which their life expectancy was very short. Travel in any form for a runaway slave was a dangerous prospect. Both masters and local officials had the right to pursue them. And so in addition to all of the threats that came with traveling in the ancient world, they had to face the official threat as well. And as the population of slaves in the Roman Empire increased, slave uprisings increased. And so the Romans were very sensitive of slaves. They, they greatly feared the prospect of a slave uprising. So any form of disobedience by slaves was dealt with harshly. Death was not only a possibility, 
but in many cases, it was a foregone conclusion. Now, that was a very broad statement that I just made. And the truth is, as we look at the text, we see that Paul is taking every precaution that he can to take care of Onesimus, isn't he? In Colossians chapter 4, verse 1, he wrote, Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And so he's already paving the way for the church and for Philemon to know how to receive Onesimus. And he sent Onesimus with a travel companion, didn't he? Old Tychicus, right? His name means fortunate. Anybody remember that? With a name like fortunate, everyone knows everything's going to be okay. But here's the thing. When Paul told Onesimus, my son... I love you, but you have to go back. When he said that to Onesimus Church, even if Philemon was an all-around great guy, even if he had a wonderful reputation in the church, even if he was an outlier as a good master in the ancient day, at that point, when Paul says, go back, Philemon had every right under Roman law to punish Onesimus, And there was no guarantee that Paul wasn't sending Onesimus to his death. And Paul knew that. And Onesimus knew that. And guess what, church? He went. He went. Why? Why would you do something like that? Why would you take that kind of risk when you've escaped that life? The gospel changed Onesimus, church. The truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus had done had changed Onesimus' life. And so according to Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 to 23, Onesimus was once alienated and hostile in mind, doing hostile, e- evil deeds, but Christ had now reconciled Onesimus in his body of flesh by his death in order to present Onesimus holy and blameless and above reproach before him, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. Onesimus understood the cost that God had, according to Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, canceled the wreck of de- record of debt that stood against Onesimus with its legal demands. This he nailed aside, nail, set aside, nailing it to the cross. And according to verse 15, Onesimus knew that no ruler or authority could ultimately hold sway over him anymore, for Christ had triumphed over all of them. So on the other side of the cross fully aware, fully believing in the salvation that he has in Christ. Onesimus takes inventory of his love for Christ, which has produced in him love for Paul. And Onesimus understood that there was a relationship between him and Philemon, another brother in Christ that had been broken, that he needed to address both personally and so that the ministry that he is conducting with Paul would not be tainted, so that he could remain above reproach and remain apart from accusation. And so Onesimus was with Paul when Paul spoke Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 to 24, into existence. When he says, slave, obey everything, or in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Knowing who Christ is and knowing what Christ had done for him, Onesimus knew that there was only one option. It was radical commitment to Christ, and it was a radical step out in faith. The world would have been shocked when they saw Onesimus showing up in Colossae. I wager the church would have been shocked as well. But in Christ, an act that would be lunacy to the world was his only choice. That's an amazing testimony. And in and of itself, it proves our point. Let's not skip over Philemon. Look at what it says about him. Verse 15. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, 
that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than that, a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in flesh and in the Lord. Now, church, notice Paul does not technically require Philemon to free Onesimus. Might have been implied, it was not stated. But by asking him to give consent to assisting Paul, in asking Philemon to welcome Onesimus into his presence and into the community, and in calling Philemon to treat Onesimus as a beloved brother, a partner even, according to verse 17, Paul was defying every Roman tradition. He was flipping over every table of the justice system. And he's telling Philemon that even if Onesimus was to re-enter slavery, their relationship is never going to be the same. They are now called to be brothers, both in the flesh here and now, and in the Lord. I cannot stress how crazy this would have been to the rest of the world. You did not treat your slaves as brothers. You did not fail to punish a slave that disobeyed you. In fact, the historical evidence strongly suggests that to fail to obey Roman standards in punishing your slaves was to face the prospect of persecution and imprisonment yourself. And so for the average Roman, Paul was asking Philemon to do the impossible. But Philemon wasn't your average Roman. Philemon belonged to Jesus and church. Jesus changes everything. Philemon would have known the value of the gospel that he had received from Paul. Even apart from being called as a master who serves a master, Philemon would have heard Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 through 5, to seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on those things above, not the things that make sense on earth. Philemon knew that his life now was hidden with Christ in God, so that when Christ, who is his life, appeared, he would appear with Christ in glory. Philemon knew that in Christ there was no Greek, no Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and he is in all. And Philemon knew that if Onesimus was to be his brother in the Lord, they were to now bear with one another. And they were to, if one has complaint against another, they were to forgive each other, even as the Lord has forgiven you, Philemon. So you must also forgive. And as controversial as that prospect might have been to the world, for Philemon, the course was clear. In Christ, his former slave was now his brother. And the implication of that fact is that he would spend eternity with Onesimus one day with the Lord. Which meant that in this life now, he needed to make the radical commitment to radical change. Jesus changes everything, church. And the truth is, there will be in this life change that, subtle, that occurs subtly because of Jesus. But we must also understand that if we believe this gospel is true, it means that when, not if, when the call to radical obedience presents itself in our lives, If that call comes through the Word of God and by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, then the only proper response to that call every time is to obey. What's the call in your life today? We've been unpacking these commands that God has given. What radical change needs to occur in your life today in response to the work that God has done in your life? Listen, is there a call to some impurity in your life that you're sweeping under the carpet. Some, something that society dismisses is not really a big deal, right? Technically, it's legal. You could totally find it on the internet. But Christ called you to put it to death. Is there a new mindset of love and respect that needs to saturate your marriage? Is there a call to obedience in your home that needs to take place in the way that you're parenting your kids? Or as we've seen in the text today, are you denying forgiveness to someone who the world says is unworthy, even impossible to forgive? The gospel requires radical commitment, church. 
What Christ has done insists on radical change. One more point. The gospel or gospel change always identifies with a big Christ. It's a fun one. Gospel change always identifies with a big Christ. Okay. A lot of things we could consider as we're wrapping up this letter. We spent a lot of time last week talking about final greetings um, and the awesome truth that grace is both um, to us and with us. All right. So go back to last week if you want to hear more about that. As we close our time today, let's consider Paul for a second. Let's put Philemon and Onesimus to the side. As he closes up this letter, it is really fascinating. Paul um, perhaps expects that his incarceration is going to go well, right? That it's going to come to a conclusion. Prepare a room, he says. And he seems very encouraged that the letter that he's writing to Philemon is going to be responded to well. But see, I think the most compelling uh, part of how Paul concludes this letter that might serve as a summary to our entire series is the image of Christ that we get in verses 17 to 20. Read with me. It says, If you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, I write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owning or owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ as you've refreshed the rest of the church. Here's a fun fact. Something really neat that Paul is doing here. In most of the letters that Paul writes, he does a really good job of explaining the, the gospel, the indicatives of it, right? Pretty much every gospel does. Paul doesn't do that here in this letter. See, he doesn't describe Jesus in a very big way. He doesn't um, talk about or mention even sin or the need to repent. Google it. Uh, read the Bible, but maybe Google it. I don't know. Look for it. Sin, repent. The words are not there. In fact, he does not even mention the cross once. And yet, don't you think, as Philemon takes a look at this final part of the passage, and he's considering his need to forgive his slave, and he's reading this letter from Paul in prison, don't you think he's settled on these words? If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Church, it's hard to say what a slave would have been worth at that time, right? The value of a slave would have, would have changed based on their skills or the economy. But the common slave was probably worth about 500 denarii, and a denarius would have been worth a man's, a common man's uh, day's wage. So you think about it. Uh, Onesimus would have at least been worth about a year and a half worth of wages. And Paul says in his own writing, I'll repay it in prison. Where's the resource there? How's he going to pay that off? But see, that's not the point of what Paul's saying, is it? He says in verse 19, I say nothing of your owning, owing me, even yourself. See, he reminds Philemon of what he has already received from Paul in Christ. He's reminding Philemon of an amazing truth in that moment. The gospel has led such a stamp on Paul's heart. And Paul understood what his own value was to Jesus, that Jesus considered the worth of Paul and Philemon and Onesimus and Timothy and the church in Colossae and you and me, and that he considered his life nothing when it came to the insurmountable debt that had to be paid in order that you and I would be free from our bondage. And in the face of the price to be paid in that moment, church, do you know what Jesus said? Do you know what he looked up at the Father of all creation and said? Father, they have wronged you, and they cannot pay what they owe, but charge that to my account. 
I, Jesus, state this with my life. I will repay it. There is no price that Paul would not be willing to pay for his brother in Christ because he knew that there was no length that Jesus would not be willing to go to reconcile the ones that he loved to him. The gospel leads to change, and sometimes that might be subtle, and oftentimes it is radical, but always, always, always it will be based not on what you can do for God, but what he has already done for you. Big Christ changes everything, church. Our Lord said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 to 26, the, Jesus told the disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, they will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Church, not if, but when you face the call by God and by his people to make a radical sacrifice for the sake of Christ, what's your response going to be? In that moment where you need to decide where you will place your trust and what truth you will base your actions on, what will you decide? At the same time that Paul wrote Philemon and the Colossians, there's a good chance that he was facing the end of his life. And so he writes in a separate letter to the Philippians what he had to say on the matter. He says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Church, what are we going to do? What kind of people are we going to choose to be as we set out in this new year and this new season for our church and our community as we, are, as we are wrestling with both the imperatives of Scripture and the commands that need to saturate our own lives and we are contemplating the, uh, the, the evangelical effort that needs to take root both in this community, in this season, and across the world as we send missionaries out? Who are we going to be? We need to be a people that says Christ is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, this church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, in everything that he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things, whether in earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, and abounding in love and thanksgiving. Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above and not the things that are on this earth, for you have died and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And so put to death what is earthly in you, and put on a new New self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of your creator. And whatever you do or word or indeed do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him and see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for the truth of it, Lord. We thank you for your son and, and just the, the overwhelming truth uh, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is bigger than we can possibly imagine and fathom. And yet, in, in all of that immensity, he took on flesh. He became low for our sake. Lord, Jesus, you experienced everything that we experience. You died on the cross. Uh, the death that we deserved, Lord, you rose again to affirm your power to save us. We get the chance to celebrate that so soon. Lord, would you fill our hearts with the truth of it? Would you convict the hearts in here that don't believe it? And Lord, would you compel our hearts to be people who seek after this truth to be spread wherever you call us to, in our homes and in our families, as husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, as children, as uh, 
workers and, and as bosses, Lord, in every way, shape, or form, as you send us out, God, would you fill us with the heart that sees a very big Jesus. And in response to the work that you have done, Lord, would you make us a people that makes disciples who make disciples. Jesus, we desire this, and we desire that you would do this in us. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Go ahead and stand for a closing song. Peace. Have a great day.